Welcome everyone to this joint meeting of the Metro Council Affordable Housing Committee and Health Hospitals and Social Services Committee. Um, we are meeting electronically as allowed by the um, governor's orders. We're gonna read that um, motion and then ask someone if they will make and second that motion and then uh, ready to begin. So pursuant to Governor Lee's executive order number 16 and several others extending it regarding electronic messages as extended by executive orders 34 and 51, I make a motion that this committee meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the Metro Council. And the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Do I have a motion? From either motion. committee. And a second. Second, second. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hurt. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are meeting as required. So with that, I will welcome uh, Council Member Hurt, Chair of the Health and Hospitals Committee. Um, and hopefully the rest of the folks will be able to get the access codes they need. I see more, more committee members coming in, so I think we're close. Um, because this is a called meeting and there is no business before us, um, I will just take note of the committee members that are here, but I don't know that we need to do an official roll call unless someone wants to speak up and say that we do. Um, and so with that, I will just um, uh, thank Council Member Hauser for making the request to get an update on um, what is going on with the state of people experiencing homelessness and how is the city working uh, to help meet some of their needs and also some of the nonprofits. Um, and so I asked uh, Judy Tackett and Ingrid McIntyre um, if they could come provide information and they suggested a number of other people that could also provide very helpful information. Um, and I will let them introduce themselves in um, what order they would like to present and also thank um, Hannah Davis who I think is also trying to make it into this meeting. I don't see her yet so um, if, um, Danielle or whoever's been helpfully sending out the new link could send that to Hannah as well. Perhaps she will join us shortly. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Judith Tackett and let her um, proceed through the, the people that she knows has presentations. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us and a, a special thank you to both committee chairs for allowing us to present and actually giving setting aside a special meeting for that. Um, I will start with a presentation, but before I do, I wanted to thank uh, MDHA Mel Alexander as the representative from MDHA. Uh, I see Susie told me on there and uh, as well. Um, so I, sorry. Um, I also, um, after we, so I will start a presentation. Do you want to see I'm in the meeting. Of course, they can't hear me. Let me cut it down. Oh, no. It's not my problem. It's a public work. That's me. It was me. Whoever has called in, we can hear you. Could you please mute? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I was not sure if it just was on my end. Um, thank you so much McIntyre, to also be uh, on the call and, and, and present. Uh, I will actually shift and then I also wanted to do a special thank you to Heather Lashaw who's calling in. She's here to help with uh, Q&A. She is um, uh, representing the federal, um, she, she's the technical assistance provider um, that we are receiving in our city to address homelessness and, and, and build the system. Uh, she's um, hired by the federal uh, department of housing. And I wonder if you still have some background or if it's just me. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> whoever called in with the phone number 615-571 something, can you please mute? Hold, hold, and, and that was it. I think he just kind of like jack or something. He had it going out. 
in the dirt that's down I think she stepped away from her computer, and I think we just need to, can we mute her? Put it up out the window. I'll go ahead and add, I'll go ahead and mute. And see, we never would have known it if we had. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So if you bear with me, and, and if you let me know if you can, as soon as you can see my screen, I'm trying to pull up a PowerPoint so you can follow my presentation. Can you all see this? Yes, we can. Okay. So basically what I'm trying, um, what, what we're doing, um, what I just went, the agenda is I, I will provide a quick homelessness situation overview uh, and then hand it over to MDHA to talk about the grants um, that our um, city is about to receive to address homelessness and uh, go into that and then um, turn it over to Ingrid McIntyre for community observations and especially from the nonprofit um, perspective and then we can go into uh, Q&A from everyone. So when we look at, and many of you have, have heard me say for years that we are really not at the point where we need to be on the data front. Um, I, what we do have is a point in time count in our city. That's a one time snapshot. It's very limited data. Uh, it's one date in January. Uh, this one was the night of January 20, uh, 23 and 22. Uh, 2020, sorry, um, it's the narrowest definition of homelessness. Pretty much this count looks at people that are that night in emergency shelter situations on the streets or in encampment. It does not include uh, people in motels. It usually does not include um, a lot of families because they are more in motels or in couch surfing or doubled up situations. So that's all not included. The point in time count is a federal requirement um, and by the end of every year, um, the federal uh, government, the uh, Housing and Urban Development Department is uh, putting together from all these point in time count data sets across the nation, a report to Congress. Um, what I also wanted to point, what I wanted to say is um, we had seen a trend over the last few years of the point in time count in Nashville going down. It's a, it is is a measure to see where we're trending, but it does not give us an, an unduplicated annual count or a full uh, evaluation of what the situation in Nashville is. It's a tool that needs to be looked at with other data points. One of the data points that we are working on, and all of you should have heard me talk about at one point or another, is the homeless management information system. It's a database and here is, I just give you an example of what it can do if there is enough data quality in there. And if um, pretty much every provider and especially the large providers in our community enter into HMAS, it will produce unduplicated numbers, analyzed numbers um, here in this example. And I will be happy to forward this to all of you. This is the latest poll that we had for housing placement rates. Um, but what the caveat is right now, this is the information you can get out of homeless management information system. We in Nashville are not at the point where we have all the providers in there to give us a full picture. This is what you see is what we have. It's not, we know it's not the full picture yet, but we're working uh, very, very um, focused on working towards this. Um, I'm in touch with, with local shelters to get them in there so we can have better demographic breakdowns, length of time it takes for people to access housing and um, just overall information. This is really just a sample of what you will get once we have the data quality in there. One of the things that we are actually also focused on, and this is information we would get out of the homeless management information system, is what is called by name lists. We can pull these by name lists at any time. We can pull it population specific, and it can be used to be very data focused and data driven around certain populations. This is our veterans by name list. It is actually the one data that is really high quality in our system. We have worked very hard with all the veteran providers 
to um, and continue to work on that. And this is also another uh, example, the latest one um, that we pulled. And um, this is where we want to get to. Together with a point in time, this is actually a point in time at any time we want it. And if you have high quality data in our system, that's where we're going to get a fuller picture. Um, right now, we are pretty solid in our veterans by name list and the youth and young adult by name list. But we are not solid on the individual by name list, which is the majority of our people experiencing homelessness in Nashville are individuals. Or, or the family by name list. We're just not quite there yet. Um, we are really good capturing uh, families that come um, into the Metro system and to um, work with Metro, but we need to um, do some improvements with the entire community around that as well. One of the things I think everybody is uh, interested in hearing is um, really focusing on COVID-19 and what has been happening here. So I started a timeline just to give you a little bit on in, in mid-March, um, the Safer at Home order went into effect. March 17, Room in the Inn was forced to shut down their winter shelter program. Usually every year, Room in the Inn's winter shelter program, that's the congregations that open, and you probably all have heard about, uh, runs from November 1st through the end of March, through March 31st. When COVID happened, the weekend before March uh, 17, that prior weekend, um, a lot of congregations pulled out of uh, participating in the congregation uh, program and so room and in just did not have um, the it's a volunteer based program and they just could not continue doing it uh, March 26 uh, Metro opens the social distancing shelter at the fairgrounds this was really set up to by listening to the nonprofits with with room and in being affected with um, Nashville Rescue Mission uh, not being able to uh, implement social distancing at the shelter, Metro opened that um, location at the fairgrounds. Then in early April, Metro um, also first uses their isolation and quarantine shelter at the fairgrounds. I'm going to go a little bit more into that um, on the next um, slides. In June 27, uh, Metro then opened in, in the municipal auditorium for women. That really became necessary when we looked at the, we are in this long term. And uh, so we th there was really um, a, a lot of effort going into that, opening a, a second location for women. So the fairgrounds has clearly separated buildings. And when I say separated buildings, then there is the social distancing shelter, which also is referred to as the well shelter. That's for COVID negative population. The capacity is 250 uh, beds um, in that location. The social distancing shelter, as I said, that's for women at the municipal auditorium. Um, for COVID negative women, it's uh, 200 bed capacity. Then there is also an isolation shelter set up based on health department guidelines. That one, that location is in a, in a separate building at the fairgrounds as well. It's completely separated from the well shelter and it is it houses people when they are um, what is called and referred to as PUIs, people under investigation. It's really under investigation, waiting for tests for COVID. It's really COVID specific. And then if they um, are, um, if people uh, are diagnosed as COVID positive, there is a separate setup also at the fairgrounds uh, where they are isolated. Um, the CDC, the so federal government actually visited um, the fairgrounds the week of July 6. And I just learned it, it was representatives from the CDC, FEMA and HHS and um, we're very pleased um, with what was and how it was set up and they want to look at it as a model for other cities to look at uh, when they do congregate sheltering. So the, uh, at the beginning as of uh, July, at the beginning of July, the social distancing shelter has served uh, 239 people. 
uh, on the COVID, uh, on that um, sick shelter side, you know, COVID plus and PUI side, a total of 112 unduplicated people have gone through that. And then I pulled, um, or I was provided the, the census for today. Um, there were 97 men on um, the social distancing shelter, 23 women at the municipal auditorium, eight uh, people under investigation. They are waiting for test results and three people um, that were um, just waiting under quarantine until they're not until they become negative, um, they are COVID positive. Um, the access to the metro shelters. So that again, the initial purpose of the metro shelters was to enable existing shelter system, which in our city, um, National Rescue Mission provides 365 days of emergency shelter. And it, it really allows them to implement social distancing. I looked at there right now um, pretty much at half capacity of what they usually run. They do not, and that's National Rescue Mission, I checked in with them, they are not turning people away, but they are making sure and working with Metro to make sure that the social distancing um, is enabled, six foot dis distance. They usually don't use the um, cots on the upper, you know, they have this um, double, beds, I don't know what the term is right now, if somebody wants to jump in, but they're using really the bunk beds and they're using just the lower bunk beds to really uh, creating a, a safe environment there. The access to the metro shelter is through that partnership with National Rescue Mission um, and then also through partnerships with local hospitals. When local hospitals have people come through that test COVID positive and are experiencing homelessness, there's a whole process with the health department in place for them to access um, the metro shelter, the COVID positive uh, side of the shelter. And I need to be very clear again, the way I just formulated it is not, you know, can be misleading. It's, it's completely separate from the well shelter. Um, and it's set up based on um, Metro Health Department guidelines that followed the CDC guidelines for a safe setup. Any other people that access the Metro shelter need to be tested and will access the isolation center if they don't have a negative test yet until they have that negative test result. And this is to make sure that everybody is, um, that, that the shelter is, continues to be COVID negative on the well side. Um, again, the CDC wants to use Nashville as a model to set up congregate shelters uh, for other peer cities. Uh, at this point, we have not had any COVID infections that came from a metro shelter. Um, mass testing was conducted um, in, in April after a few people, as they transferred from Nashville Rescue Mission, showed symptoms, and that was during the transfer. Um, so the health department went in and tested the fair, everybody who was at the fairgrounds at that time, and that was 235 people that were tested. 18 tested positive plus one staff member. That was 8% um, of the shelter population at that point. Um, I want to make sure that this compares at the same time, the general population tested positive at a 10% rate. Um, on April 30th, 395 people were tested at the MANS campus of uh, National Rescue Mission, and there 28% were considered uh, positive. And you have to break down on the slide. Um, any questions on that before I move on to encampments? And can you still hear me? For some reason, everything is so quiet. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> I just wanted to test on that one. So uh, in the encampments, um, when I say based on past reports, these are from the past few years when I checked in with, with different nonprofits and also with Metro Police. Um, overall, the estimate of encampments in the community are usually hovering between 100 and 150. The way I define here encampments is a person living in a tent in some type of structure. 
So this does not include people sleeping on the street or uh, with, with a blanket under a bridge. This is really some type of uh, structure. In March, we, the Homeless Impact Division, immediately reached out to nonprofits that have outreach workers and asked them to help us identify where encampments are right now. And um, together, the community identified 86 encampments um, with an estimated encampment population of about 530. And interestingly enough, that kind of lines up with the point in time count, which had happened in January. We do know that we, we missed some encampments through that and people are uh, moving around. And that was also um, still around the time when the winter sheltering was um, uh, winding down. And people usually uh, use, quite a few people use room and in. That was just around right before that time and around that time. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Uh, I have a question. When you said 100 to 150 encampments, do you mean 100 to 150 people or actually 100 to 150 sites? Sites. Sites. Yes. Oh, wow. So that could be thousands of people. Um, that could be, I would say, my estimate would be you take the 530 and you add about 30 to 40 percent. And that's a good estimate. So it would be, I would be 800 to 1,000. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So what we did with that information, you know, when, when we looked and, and, and identified clearly 86 with address where the, um, that's actually the community that did that, that identified uh, where these locations are. Uh, that allowed us to identify, so what happens with food? Because food insecurity was an instant. That's the first time since I've been around in this field in Nashville that there was a clear food insecurity for people experiencing homelessness because meals and have shut, uh, shut down, uh, um, just the accessibility to food was not there like it had been before uh, for years. And so we focused on an outreach collaboration, um, food box drop off. Um, uh, thank you that we created a partnership with Ingrid McIntyre uh, and her church where food could be dropped off and outreach workers would then go and pick them up there. We also at the same time placed for 14 sanitation stations that's porta potties and hand washing equipment uh, in, in different locations um, close to the larger encampments. Um, we created a website for a quick uh, exchange on what services are available because a lot of service providers had changed their service models. And so uh, we did a blitz on what are those changes and posted them online. Um, currently about 250, and Ingrid may have an update a little later on, uh, 250 food boxes are still being delivered on a weekly basis. Um, we also have focused on bringing uh, healthcare providers together. Neighborhood Health is doing a great job going out into encampments and uh, looking what they can do to provide uh, telehealth. They're in the process of also starting to test in encampments. They're waiting for federal equipment to come through and are very close to getting that done. And they're working with, in collaboration with the health department to have correct protocols in place for that. Um, we have throughout, since March, I have several, uh, hosted several webinars with local providers just to bring them together online and coordinate amongst each other. I did one with Peer City uh, in the state because I wanted to see if they saw the same issues that we've seen in encampments. Um, the Salvation Army has been activated by TEMA, they're an organization. Uh, uh, TEMA is the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. And uh, they are working also on coordinating with nonprofits and uh, identifying what the needs are. They are set up to receive FEMA funding and um, hopefully, you know, that makes it quicker to actually get services into encampments. I listed mm -hmm. some of the partners on here. Um, not all of them are listed, but we are, it's, I, I try to list the, the most active partners on that are always on all the calls and everything. And I'm, seeing, I think I'm missing Oasis Center right off the bat. Um, there are laminated encampment cards that are distributed along with food boxes for basic information for health access and mental health access. 
And then um, one of the things that we are, have been discussing all along is how do we deliver basic needs um, in, coordinated, in a coordinated way without um, too close and too much traffic in and out of encampments because we don't want to bring COVID in or take it back out and distribute it. You know, it's 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 really important that we we allow people to isolate or stay contained within their encampments. Um, one of the things, and I think I have not mentioned it. I, I think I'm getting to it a little bit. If not. Um, uh, one of the things I also looked at motel vouchers. Um, there were four organizations that along the way had motel vouchers that they used. One is Community Care Fellowship uh, that was really targeting the most ind uh, vulnerable individuals. They're using referrals through the coordinated entry system, where um, were about they served about a total of 18 people at this point and took them out of encampments. Um, we adjusted our prioritization tools. So coordinated entry is a process that uses um, the homeless management information system as a database. There's a community-wide assessment that is completed. And through that assessment, um, some of the most, it, it, there's kind of a point system involved to identify who is extremely vulnerable and needs the highest level of assistance. Uh, basically, the vulnerability takes into account physical health, mental health, and also the ability to survive outdoors, basically. And what we added is um, the Homelessness Planning Council added a consideration and prioritization for COVID-19, people with underlying health conditions to that tool. And Community Care Fellowship is completely following that and taking referrals. The Homeless Impact Division is, is um, the coordinator around all of this. Safe Haven Family Shelter is another organization that has, um, or, uh, for, month, for I would say a few years now, taken referrals from the coordinated entry process. They moved their shelter operation, which they usually have on 3rd Avenue um, South, they moved all of that into motels. They found it's easier um, to isolate people it was too difficult with, with children and everything around to, to do safe distancing. They have continued their uh, emergency shelter operation as usual and have housed quite a few people because both of these programs focus on getting people into housing out of the motels as quickly as possible and into housing. Then the supportive services for veteran families, um, which is the federal government, the VA, has uh, made quite a few additional dollars uh, through COVID uh, available through the SSVF program. And locally, uh, mostly Center Stone and Operation Stand Down are providing services to veterans uh, with SSVF. Um, they are focusing on veterans. They have also reached out to the fairgrounds, and we are working um, with them to identify, we as in Metro Social Services is working in identifying veterans uh, who then can move into motels and be in an isolation, isolated situation and get the services through the VA. Launchpad is a youth provider and uh, through May they had uh, invested into some vouchers. They ran out of, um, they, they shifted their winter shelter program, which they usually have in a congregate setting at churches to use motel vouchers for that, but they ran out of funding uh, in May. So when encampments, there are six large encampments and the way we define large encampments was 20, they have 20 or more people um, in the encampment. Um, the more, most urgent needs are um, in, in the Jefferson Street Bridge encampment. They're right now about 50, or so people on the there. Um, and then the Brookmead encampment, there are about 40 to 50 people. And then what we call Old Tent City, there are 75 to 100 people. Um, it fluctuates uh, quite a bit there. Um, right now, when we look at, I, I would say, and, and the reason you see that number, that's how I will prioritize uh, what I've heard based on complaints, based on concerns and based on feedback from nonprofit providers. Um, 
mental health is a huge issue that we're running into. People have had struggles accessing their medication. I actually had a, an emergency call with providers that serve Jefferson Street Bridge. The situation is unhealthy. Um, violence is rampant. Uh, people are not safe living there. It's uh, We really are right now discussing a, a plan with the nonprofits on creating a event to bring services in on one day and really have a more coordinated, focused approach rather than and everybody trying to say, I'm doing this and this, but not coordinating even with the timing. So we need to really beef that up, frankly. Um, then downtown is another um, uh, area. And one of the reasons public libraries are closed. People, there are a lot of people, especially in the downtown public library, that use the library during the day. They're now um, outside. Um, in addition, Room in the Inn had a day center that where usually people would be hanging out indoors. And now they're entering the day center for services 20 at a time versus before people would just be there and inside for, for hours at a time. Um, so all of that makes homelessness way more visible in, in the downtown area. In addition today, um, Church Street Park closed for renovations and that happened today. There were about 20 to 30 people that regularly were um, sleeping there and uh, the people are now moving somewhere else in downtown. So there is gonna be another, um, we probably gonna see increase in other areas in downtown, wherever people go. And one of the things that we do and everybody does with outreach is to encourage people to go indoors. Um, in encampments, there is a reason people just don't want to go indoors for various reasons and uh, from um, regulations and rules from going in and out from um, just they don't want to be in, in a crowded situation. And so I would actually say that um, when we look at the larger encampments, and I'm saying here that there are six large encampments, 20 plus people. I would say from the outdoor population, at least half of the population is in those six large encampments. Um, the next steps, and that's where I'm gonna, is coordinated entry and housing assessments is a must. So we're really focusing on getting into encampments and focus starting to focus on the six large encampments to get people into the database. So we know where people are and they are also um, available. We, we can identify them as funding becomes more available. And that's here is where I actually uh, wanted to turn it over to MDHA to talk about the ESG dollars, the emergency solution grant dollars and any other dollars they want to talk about that are coming down from the federal government to address homelessness and what opportunities that could present for us. Emil, don't forget to unmute. Yeah, Emil or or I don't know who the the presentation. I was uh, I, I was talking away and didn't realize I was <laughs> on mute. Um, but Emil Alexander with the Community Development Department here at MDHA. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the HUD funding that is coming to Nashville to respond to COVID-19 amongst our homeless population specifically, and then some CDBG funding that's coming that would help us to, um, which really addresses low to moderate income families, but really is um, sort of helping to prevent homelessness um, in our city. Um, so the largest source is coming from HUD through the Emergency Solution Grant Program, as Judy mentioned, or ESG. HUD has notified us that Nashville will receive two separate ESG allocations through the CARES Act. Um, the first allocation is 1.5, a little bit over 1.5 million. Um, the second allocation is a little bit over 8.4 million for a total of $10 million um, coming through to Nashville through um, the ESG grant program. And to give you an idea, we usually receive somewhere around 400 to $440,000 each year um, through ESG funding. So this is a substantial amount of money coming to Nashville 
um, to help respond to COVID-19 amongst our homeless population. Um, we're also fortunate, as Judy mentioned, to have a HUD technical assistant consultant, Heather Dillashaw, who's also on the call, to help us to coordinate a strategic plan um, with MDHA, the mayor's office, um, Metro Social Services, the Homeless Planning Council, along with our nonprofit um, stakeholders to develop a strategy for how these funds will be spent. So back in July, we released an RFA for the first allocation of EFG funding, that's the 1.5 million, um, inviting nonprofit service providers to apply for that funding. That application deadline ended ends at midnight tonight, and MDHA will begin to evaluate those applications and make funding awards quickly over the next couple of weeks. Um, the second allocation of funding, the 8.4 million, um, we hope to finalize priority areas um, for this allocation with our leadership team that meets weekly. Um, uh, RFA will be released within the next 30 days. And again, nonprofit service providers will have an opportunity to, provide, to apply for those fundings. Um, and then we'll make those funding um, awards and get those funds um, distributed um, out into the community. Um, in addition, Nashville was allocated 3.1 million in CDBG funding. And that funding through our action plan has been dedicated to provide emergency housing assistance, that's rental payments, mortgage um, assistance for those families who've either lost their job or had a reduction in employment because of COVID-19. Um, and we hope to have a subrecipient selected within the next couple of weeks for that program and that program up and running um, within the next 30 days. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Judy. Okay, I would like to turn the, if you can get the host over to Ingrid McIntyre. Thanks. If I can learn quickly how to share my screen, I'll do it. Awesome. Oh, you're good. So fantastic. Okay, I'm getting there. Okay, here we go. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so this is just um, a bit of, a, of, of some community observations um, since the time of COVID. Um, I pulled together just several other folks who, um, who work in the community like I do, and then also tried to talk to some folks who are outside of our community and get some of their perspectives too. Um, Judy has done <laughs> incredible work and I just want to make sure that I say hats off to you and thank you for all the time and energy you've spent to get as much done that we've been able to do in Nashville um, around homelessness during this time. Um, let's see. Um, similar to what Judy said, we have around 800 people in encampments. Um, when we have when shelters are full is around 1200 people and then around 4000 is what we think are in hotels and motels and that number is just from um, what we know from children in metro schools so that's mostly just children we know that there's so many more people right than just that um so this is the minimum scope of our work um, and approximately 600 people have been tested so far out of all the folks that we serve. Um, the word from the streets when I asked our folks what it was that they really needed is they need water and cooling stations. They need safe places to sleep. They need food. Um, like Judy said, this is probably the only time that I, in my work here, um, where we've ever had like a food shortage and it's been it's been pretty intense. So um, food supply is pretty low. They say that they need meds and healthcare, particularly, particularly their mental health meds. Um, they need internet to have access to services a lot of times, safe transportation. They want to be tested um, and they need housing. Those were the things that they asked for. Um, I have just, we know, you know, that numbers uh, say a lot, but stories say more. And so just really quickly, I have three quick stories um, to share with you all about folks that we know. Um, on Sunday, we were notified of a death um, of a woman that happened at Old Tent City, and it was confirmed that it was a heat-related death. 
Um, there were multiple other people who had heat related seizures that same day. Um, so we know that, that not only COVID, but also the heat is affecting our folks. Um, one of the outreach workers I talked to said that they found a man outside of Walmart who had recently lost his housing. Um, he's in a wheelchair and definitely has some mental and cognitive impairments. When this person found him, his arms were both burned so badly from the sun that there were blisters and open wounds um, and blood. And she gave him some burn spray, antibacterial burn spray and sunscreen. But because of his um, mental health issues, refused to put on a long sleeve shirt. Um, he was trying, he's trying to panhandle to get a room for the night is what he was doing. Um, so that's an experience. And then another experience was of a young man who was, who was housed, um, but having difficulty connecting with mental health resources that he needed. Um, so he was taken to Vanderbilt, but fled with just the clothes he had on with no shoes. Um, and later, um, some folks had been trying to find him, but the encampment folks in the encampments immediately recognized him. Um, and unfortunately he was found dead. So, you know, we don't know what that is. It makes me feel like probably he was feeling pretty hopeless, um, when it came to his mental health, um, his mental health stuff. So those are just hard stories that, um, and hard experiences that we hear about every day. Um, when I talk to general population folks um, or folks who live in houses, unlike the folks who don't, um, they these are the questions that they were asking me. Um, why are there all of a sudden so many people living on the streets? Why is there no urgency from the city to create cooling stations? Why is there not a private place to care for folks who've tested for COVID? Who's in charge and how can we help? Those are the questions that I heard when I asked for a response. Um, just wanted to make sure to push point the home or push point the home, push point the, um, the point that push forward the point, sorry, that the primary and essential function of housing is to provide a safe and sheltered space is absolutely fundamental to people's health and well-being. Um, I'm sure for many of you who know me, you've heard me say housing is health. Housing is healthcare, um, and also I know it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but that housing uh, ends homelessness as well. So um, housing can do a lot for our folks. Other observations that I got from some of our um, nonprofit providers was obviously there's a lack of low-income affordable housing. Um, we're having a harder time with housing retention because folks who have maybe had a job in the past don't have it anymore, even if it was just, um, you know, even if it was a minimum wage job that was helping them pay their part of the rent, um, they're not able to do that. Lack of access to support, um, which included was mostly the internet. Um, MDHA not processing folks into housing who have been approved for vouchers has been hard to understand. Um, why there aren't more hotel vouchers, um, lack of public restrooms. Um, the frustration with the state's general lack of understanding of Nashville systems, and then in the collaboration and streamline planning, it felt very um, strange, and, strange and almost like there was a pull between like, should we sort of follow the city instructions or should we follow the state instructions? Um, and so that was a little strange for some of us. Um, extreme decline in mental health care, overcrowded encampments, and a general feeling of hopelessness. So I'm just here to say we don't have a homeless problem. We have a housing problem. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. That's... That's a, a big challenge to us, which is what our committee is supposed to be looking at solutions for. Edith, do you have other folks that we want to be hearing from? But real quick, Hannah is here and I think has to leave at six. If Hannah could, if you want to address anything real quick, I'll, I'll give you the mic before you have to go and then we'll, then we'll see if we have Q&A time. Let's leave the unmute Hannah if you do want anything. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, obviously, I would echo what Ingrid said that um, I am biased because I do this all day, every day. But of course, um, as everyone on this call, I think we are 
um, joined together by the belief that we need more affordable housing in Nashville. Um, and I had a number of calls today about how we can improve that coordination. Like, again, how Ingrid was saying, um, in terms of, oh gosh, sorry, I got some background noise. Um, in terms of how we can make it more clear for people who are seeking housing, what the pathways are and the processes. Um, I feel like that is a, you know, there's so much focus on what we can do to fund and create more affordable housing and sort of the immediate needs that it's hard to take that step back and um, outline those sort of steps that someone would have to take. Right now, I think the user, sort of what I would dub the user experience is really challenging. And then it's not, it's really heartbreaking, but not totally surprising to me that people would get so disheartened by the process because um, it's, it's pretty opaque and um you know when the news already isn't great about what is out there in terms of affordable housing and then you sort of find yourself running up against walls over and over again um that's something that's certainly on my radar is how we can at least be really open and honest with people looking for affordable housing about the challenges that they're going to face but trying to make it as seamless as possible as they go through those various departments and funding streams so that the wall they're running into is not a lack of coordination from the service provider and metro side um, that we've at least tried to remove as many barriers. And actually the example came up today um, about the Homelessness Planning Council and that that's sort of an example of the back end coming together to create a more clear and seamless path. And I think that's reflected in the work that Ingrid and Judy have shared with today. And then I think that there's uh, the next step is for the housing side to sort of, you know, replicate that in terms of all coming together on the back end so that when someone needs affordable housing, there's an entry point that they can come to and it's much more clear than it is now. And that's just being totally transparent because I think that's a clear place for us to grow and there's no, um, you know, anyone working against each other or at least in my tenure here, I've not found anyone who's unwilling to be part of that coordination. And, um, but that, you know, everyone has just been working uh, to address the fires and the needs of today that it's hard to find that capacity to step back and do it. But um, that's, that's really all I would add is that as a, you know, on that continuum of housing, I know some people have seen the 0% AMI market rate AMI spectrum. Um, we, we do have so many conversations about how we fund additional affordable housing. I just feel really um, aware that a weakness that I'm addressing is not just that we build units, but that we make it easier for people to get into those units who are already facing, you know, a number of challenges. And then, you know, whether they're working with a service provider who's supporting them in that navigation, that, that navigation with the social worker or a provider is less take, takes less time, less time from the social worker side, they're able to move on to other tasks. And then if someone's not part of our social safety system, that they're also able to navigate that more quickly. So sort of that we would have more seamless processes all the way along that spectrum as well, no matter what that person's entry point is as they try to navigate the affordable housing system. And I can be flexible on time. Any, you know, if there's additional questions from anyone. This is Judy. If I may actually ask um, 
this is a really good segue if Heather uh, Dillashaw would, would say a few words about systems building, especially around homelessness. Uh, in 2013, uh, we really started, we as a national community, really started paying attention to what those processes and systems need to be. We have a lot to catch up on. And yes, it sounds like 2013 to now is, we, we should be further along than we are, but uh, I'm happy to send you all uh, where we've started and gone from. But Heather, if you don't mind jumping in and kind of draw a picture of systems building, what, what Hannah kind of was talking about around homelessness. Don't forget to me, Heather. Yeah, just uh, thanks. Um, thanks for uh, allowing me to be part of your meeting. I'm happy to talk a little bit um, about what that systems building is, uh, the intent of that and what we're trying to do right now. Um, one of the things I know this is, I'm certain I'm preaching to the choir about this, is that homeless service providers um, have been operating with scarce resources forever and ever, right? Like we've never had resources. Um, and this is definitely the first time the federal government has given us millions of dollars that we've never had before. Um, and so part of the, the challenge, you know, to 2013 and before, right, is that we wanted to build all these systems and we didn't have the resources to do it. Um, and so we would build systems and they would sort of work, but we didn't have either the housing or the money or the people to help figure that out. We're getting closer to that, I think, and the CARES Act money that Amel was talking about coming down gives us a unique opportunity um, to build a system to be able to handle that money. Like right now, Nashville system can't even handle $10 million um, into housing for homeless folks because they don't, no provider has ever used that amount of money uh, to, to house folks from the street, right? That, that's true in Nashville and everywhere, right? Um, and so what HUD has done is deployed folks like me to, to bigger cities, um, to really add some capacity to help you figure that out because nobody has that capacity um, because we've never been in this situation. So it, it is unfortunate, um, to your point, Ingrid, housing is healthcare and it's unfortunate that it's a pandemic that's made you know other folks pay attention to that reality in new ways, but, but let's use that moment to build a system uh, that doesn't allow folks to go back to the street or back to shelter um, because of the pandemic, but to housing, which is their single best option for health. Right, um, and so these CARES Act funds are to provide uh, for folks who are experiencing homelessness um, to prevent, prevent and protect them um, in the best ways possible, directly tied to COVID-19, and housing is the single best way to do that. Um, and so what we're working on is building a system, and Judy touched on these points about data, um, right, is, is getting an accurate um, assessment and numbers of folks who are in the encampment who do fit those categories, right? Like we know, in, in all cities and certainly in Nashville, um, is that some of the folks that are that are outside are are transient, right? They're probably not folks that are gonna stay around. Um, so let's focus on the folks that we know are your folks. Um, it doesn't mean the folks who are transient don't also need help, but they may not be as vulnerable, right? They may not be um, long stayers, chronically homeless. You know, they may not be the folks in the examples that Ingrid's talking about that are so unwell, right? That they are gonna die more quickly. Um, so let's figure out who those folks are, um, do appropriate assessments on them so that they have the services they need and get them into housing so they can actually access those services. Like everything on Ing Ingrid's list is made much more possible if you're in housing, right? About the things that people are saying that they need. Um, and so we wanna build a system that can respond to that appropriately. And so that means good data. It means that the coordinated entry system that the city is trying to build is literally that place where all the comprehensive information about your homeless uh, population is captured so that we know who's there and we know and can match accurately and appropriately folks to the the, the housing intervention that is going to be uh, most appropriate and successful for them. And this lift, it's a big lift for everybody. Uh, and it's a very doable one. We know what works and we simply have to build it um, and get the money out the door. MDHA is working hard on that piece. Um, and so we're working on building the data system, the coordinated entry system, um, and the targeted strategies on getting those housing dollars out the door so that so that they are used to effectively house, house the folks in your community that are, that are the most vulnerable from COVID. And those are the folks that have been the most vulnerable in general for a long time. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Councilman Hurt, uh, Chair of the Housing, I mean, uh, Health Hospitals and Social Services Committee. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. The one piece that I wanna to bring to the table that has not been discussed is drug use and overdosing. Um, over the last quarter, for the first quarter of this year, we have been 
um, experiencing a much higher growth in our overdosing and those who have been into emergency for overdose as well as fatalities. Probably it's about 50% increase in fatalities and about 40% in the increase in those who are overdosing. We do directly deal with people in encampments and they take care of one another. Um, and I think the homeless population take care of one another. I understand the the ideal and the, uh, the uh, need and the desire to build housing, but we've got old, you know, hotels that uh, I think that can be renovated and rehabbed to provide housing for people. I think that the schools that are closing can be used for housing and providing people with shelter to keep them away from the, the ills because these people are homeless, they're helpless, and they're hopeless. And if they at least have some of those needs met, I believe that they will help one another um, live a better life. And, and I think we've got to understand that ultimately what happens to them is the fatality, is the death. So what can we do now? And, and I also think, and I spoke to uh, Danny Herring with Habitat for Humanity, because with the work that we do at Streetworks, you know, I've looked into trying to purchase some of these buildings and to purchase some homes to be able to provide people with um, some stable housing for them. And I think that we've got to just stop talking about it and being about it. We got to just go do it and get it done. And, and, and we've got buildings, we've got vacant buildings, and we need to take those buildings that we have even homes and rehab them and get some things done to save our people. They've got to be our first and foremost priority. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. Well said. I, I would love for this group to tell us since, I mean, at least this one of the two committees is focused on trying to create more affordable housing. Can you, I think, I think the hotel question is a great one. I would love to hear if there are ways that we can make use of empty hotel rooms right now with, I mean, is it, is it, can that $10 million go to getting people into hotel rooms and would they go or do they want to be in a tent outside without rooms or like you got empty spaces and people that need to be under a roof and how do we mix those up? And any of y'all experts? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. I think, so there are two different, there are two different pieces of that question to me. Is some of that $10 million eligible for hotels? Yes. Is that the person's best option? No, the person's best option is permanent housing. If we use the $10 million to put people into motels, which are incredibly expensive, by the way, then we are missing out on the opportunity to house them for 12 months. So if you're, my specific recommendations that we don't use any of that money for motel vouchers, but that we use as much as possible for rental assistance because the number of people that we can house sustainably with rental assistance is far greater than the number of people that we can serve with motel vouchers and, and gets us a long way down the road um, to actually ending homelessness for a good portion of your population and motel vouchers are never gonna do that. I'm not speaking of hotel vouchers because we give hotel vouchers to our clients as well. I'm speaking of uh, like the hotel over there on Harding Place that's completely sure. empty and it's just sitting there, rehab it, make it available for there to be permanent housing for people who need it the most. I'm all for that. That's a great, I mean, I'm all for rehabbing existing buildings for permanent housing. These particular funds are a little bit tricky to do that with. Um, they can be rehabbed for shelter opportunities, but again, rehabbing hotels for shelter opportunities, while it may be cheaper than rehabbing them for permanent housing, is, is again still putting a lot of money into managing homelessness and not ending it right we have an opportunity to actually end it for a good portion of your homeless population and so for for the for the purview of what i'm doing i'm recommending as much goes to that piece it doesn't mean that these other these other things are also strategies you should be working on simultaneously right, right. i don't i guess i don't understand the difference the difference in um in providing homeless i mean home housing 
Get back, this is my dog. Get back, Pearl. Um, you know, of um, providing housing for people who need it. And, and if it works out for them, then they're gonna likely stay there. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing of how people in those encampments are working with us because they bring us back to them to help treat people, test people, give them needles. You know, they work together alongside. And if they were able to do this in a safe place, I think that you would find them consistently providing them, even if it may not be a uh, 10 year or 20 year you know, home for them, which it could be, but it will still be a stream where people can often, you know, those homeless communities will have a place for them to go. Sure, I, I totally understand that. And I think, again, I would recommend that you do that with them in permanent housing, rather than putting them in a shelter where they're gonna have to move again, um, and where they have to live with other people and where it's a hard, living in shelters is incredibly challenging to do. I mean, the, the reality is, is that depopulating a place like the Mission um, is, from what we've heard a little bit, is folks are happier with more space than they had at the Mission because the Mission is a bunkhouse, right? That's what most night shelters are. It is really hard, right? When I'm trapped in my house with, with too many people for, for long at a time, it's hard, right? And I have everything I need to do that. And so what we know, and this is real data, and this is true in Nashville, with, with a little bit of money you've had to do it, is if you put somebody, even some of the folks that you're talking about that have severe addiction problems, severe mental illness, if you put them in housing over the first 90 days, if you can, can, if you can keep them in housing, if you can go to them and provide those services and help them learn how to be stable inside, stay on their meds, um, there is an incredible difference in the way that they are able to function and in the choices that they make. Um, and over time, more than 75% of those folks don't become homeless again. So if you put your money toward that, right, then you have ended homelessness, right? For se over 75, if you do it well, it's higher than that, right? But over 75% of the people that you put in housing, which even if you're just looking at numbers is a better investment than managing people on the street or in shelter. Heather, I wanna, uh, I'm gonna go to Council Member Hall next, but I wanna sneak a question of my own in. Can you tell us of examples of housing that other cities have that, um, I mean, what's what's the least expensive way we could provide the most amount of permanent housing? I mean, we, you know, building one house at a time, we're doing through the Barnes Fund, and that's that's great, but it's a slow process, and we need thirty five thousand units. We think what 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 are some well, we should be copying? Sure, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about homeless folks, uh, like Judy said in your data. The majority of your folks who are homeless are single adults. So you're talking about building houses for them. You're talking about apartments, right? You're talking about one bedrooms or efficiencies, which are also the cheapest, right? And so some of the strategies that have worked in other cities are motels and turn them into SROs, right? I mean, this was the model years ago. And for some reason, at some point, somebody thought that was a bad idea, so we'd like tore them all down. And now we have a really high number of homeless folks who are single adults and almost everywhere in the country, and we don't have units. like the. The hardest unit to turn over, and in, in this is true in Nashville too, I've looked at your data, are the one bedrooms and efficiencies. Uh -huh. um, and those are the ones that you need the most. Um, and so any strategy like rent to create SROs is a good one. Um, it's a good strategy to to dedicate certain numbers of those units when you when you do have new projects come in to folks who are homeless, right? Right. Um, but it, you know, it really takes, it takes every tool you've got. There is no one answer, right? Because we also don't want to silo poverty off any more than it already is. Right, so I, you don't want to build like and I think this was the intent when they originally like got rid of SROs. You don't want a 110 unit next to another 110 unit next to another 110 unit that's just single adults who are experiencing homelessness and you're housing them into poverty. That's that's not what you want, right? Okay. Um, and at the same time, a smaller motel that could be converted into SROs for like 24 units, go for it, right? Okay. You know, so th it takes all the, these kinds of different strategies um, and looking at it as a whole community and in, in each of your areas, right? Like, you're not going to put it all in Belmede. You're not going to put it all in the South. Like, where is it going to go? Where are the transit lines and what makes the most sense, right? Um, because if you think about, like, the food the food issues, uh, which I'm sorry to hear that that's, Nashville's always been so great at feeding people. That must be very... <laughs> 
heartbreaking for y'all, but the, the food, uh, medicine, transportation, safe place, that's housing, right? That's what that is. Um, so if we can, if you can get, and we're all behind on the unit number, right? Like the 35, I'm sure you do need 35,000 affordable units, right? You can't create them all at once, but what you can do is take some, some targeted strategies to focus on and start building it from there, right? Right now, right, from my lens, is the folks that are most at risk in our current reality are, are folks who are who are literally homeless because they have no place to go. They don't, they aren't stable anyway. And so if we want those folks to be in our community and alive at the end of this thing, we gotta get them into housing. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hall. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and, and Heather really was just touching on several of the points that I was going to ask questions about because looking at some of our peer cities and, and other areas of the country where they've been successful, um, how they've been mindful not to overpopulate or target um, specific areas again and again and in creating permanent housing, what are we doing um, in that process to make sure that we're placing these units near places that have adequate public transportation access access to health care and that aren't in food deserts. I think the answer is we're not doing anything right now. <laughs> is there a problem? Well, uh, the other thing I would say, and, and you're right, I mean, th those are all the things you have to consider, right? Um, is that you're not going to get the ideal every time, right? Um, so you strive for the ideal and you work with what you have and keep building. Right. I mean, that, that's all that you can do, um, but it's better than it's better than not doing um, not doing it. And I want to this is Judy. I want to add something uh, with so many council members on the call. Um, NIMBY is a real, real issue. Mm -hmm. and you all know it. And but at the same time, when you look at where the encampments are, they're all over Davidson County. It's not in one or, or I can't point out, oh, these are the five council districts where they all are. It's all over. And the encampments usually are uh, what council uh, member Hall just said, they're, they're usually at a location that's accessible to public trans transit. So basically, if you look at what does the neighborhood where the encampments are, what do they need to serve people better? And a lot of times, a lot of the things for people, people are there for a reason. And, and so it's not one location or another it's really also looking at how do we serve our neighbors who are homeless in their neighborhood um, most of the people that we are our neighbors are in housing but there are some that are not so we're not looking at even displacing them within the city or pushing them from one council district to the next um council Mahal, anything else or can we move on to council member Vendry? said she was doing a great job she had already answered a couple of those things and i just wanted to make sure we were focused on that because i know it is a struggle um i i learned a ton from judith a few years ago um and even last year when she asked me to speak um and be part of a couple of committees and i i was just you know thrown by over this time period um looking at other cities how they've been able to um how they're struggling with some of the same things and so uh, it's no silver bullet or, or magic pill that we can utilize, and it is going to take a variety of options and approaches to uh, actually get our hands around this. But thank you. Thank you. Council Member Van Rees. Um, I wanted just to talk a little bit about the um, sample, uh, the model of Patriot Place uh, on Williams Avenue uh, in Madison. Uh, I know that it took a lot of different partners to, to make that happen, but um, it's serving homeless veterans very, very well um, and has created um, excitement in the community by being able to now with um, additional uh, activity on Williams Avenue um, be almost the, the tent pole that created a mixed income community. So um, they just, they started that before my first term began. I was like right at the beginning, I was able to see it being built and be at the ribbon cutting, um, but I understand it's doing very well. And I don't know if there's other projects like that with Buffalo Valley or with other organizations or whether or not 
um, that type of location with efficiency apart, uh, apartments with resources available um, that builds community around a common experience. Um, uh, is, are there ways to replicate that? Um, and if there's some folks from MDHA or others on the call that are familiar with uh, with Patriot Place, just to kind of see if see if there's other things like that happening. Anybody from any of those groups can speak to that. And if if they don't, I can jump in really quickly. Go for it, Judy. Okay. Uh, so basically, for the people who are not familiar with Patriot Place, the concept is permanent supportive housing and housing first. Those are the models that, that um, how it was built. Um, and frankly, the, it's also for veterans. Right now, veterans have, um, I would, probably the most resources and not, not just also before COVID, the most resources from the federal department has gone to veterans and veterans homelessness has decreased. And it's really a model of where we do need all levels of government uh, as part of the leadership and, and invest in best practice approaches like uh, housing first and permanent supportive housing. Now to Nashville, the truth is we do not have enough support services. We are, the state is not a Medicaid expanded state. So right. it's really hard to fund those supports that need to go along with permanent supportive housing. So everything we have is, is just not frankly good enough for everybody else who's not a veteran. And it's just not the intensity of the supports once people are in housing is just not um, consistent. So there is not anything and I, I may that I can really, really put my finger on, if you look at what Ruminian does in their housing, but they have the supports right there. So that could be one model, but again, we don't have the variety that we need at the level that we need it because of lack of federal funding, state uh, policies, and uh, some local investment. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gilligan. You'll need to unmute. See your hand up. There you go. Okay, I see Treva Gilligan, but I don't hear her yet. Is that someone that needs to be given privileges by the IT folks? Now you're muted again. While we'll. Ms. Gilligan? Um, Council Member Hurt, did you have another question? Well, you know, I don't have a question, but all of this stuff just goes constantly in my mind. So I was thinking about the Knights Inn that's right there at the end of the Jefferson Street Bridge. They were uh, um, hit by the tornado pretty badly. I don't know if anyone has talked to them. I know that Howard Allen had reached out to me in terms of co-housing. And again, I'm thinking about trying to get something going before and, and not just you know, waiting to build something, but can we provide housing for people then? When when Council Member Van Reese got on the phone, I was thinking about, I think it was the Memorial Hospital that's out in Madison that's vacant. So again, I'm just thinking it's, about- it's not it's not vacant. There's a deal going on. So oh, okay, just, okay. Well, but but for for so long, you know, that it was empty. And just thinking about properties, and and as I mentioned earlier, there was is a hotel over right off of Harding Place, uh, in Metroplex that is empty. And I've I've mentioned it to uh, Matt Wilshire from MDHA, providing those kinds of things that are available to utilize that and, and and if we give them a place to stay and many of them have begun to do some work and maybe they will be able to save funds where they might be able to purchase their own home at some point in time as long as they are staying in some place and, and making it easier uh, for them. So I'd just like to see some things happen. I mean, we can start start small and 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 move 
from that place and and see can we not get some success from these because it, it it is going to get worse before it gets better if you look at those numbers of the drug use and the overdosing and fatalities from drugs and all of that it goes hand in hand you know with with um people who are mentally um uh, ill as well as drug addicted and i mean i've seen employees of mine who have been clean for years but through this pandemic they have gone back out because they've had a hard time coping and and if they were not in the environment um and 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 able to kind of be away and have their own space um i think it would be helpful whether it was a permanent thing or not and i know we spend a lot of money on hotel vouchers for people that we serve and and i just think we could do a better job in saving that money and providing some housing options Councilman Moore, I think that's a, a great idea. I would ask maybe if you can begin to create that list and maybe we'll just, um, if you'll send it to me and anybody else who can think of spaces, there may be groups like Urban Housing Solutions that do that kind of construction that that may have, oh, you know, I mean, number one, somebody owns that and we, you know, we got to work with them. But as well, right. so if, we just, if we just start asking the questions, maybe we can make something happen at one of them. So I think that's a great suggestion and I would ask everybody to Start looking for those spaces and let's let's start a database of possibilities and, and work with that nonprofit. So I'll I'll get that set up. Councilmember Van Reese, are you still wishing to speak? No, I'm sorry, I'll drop my hand down. Oh. I always forget. <laughs> Councilmember House. Uh, yes, uh, I know that uh, what we got together last week um, with the uh, three council members that, that border the homeless camp in, in West Nashville, and Judith mentioned that there was an investor uh, that was looking to actually buy a, a vacant motel and turning it into uh, housing, affordable housing. Uh, is there anything else about that, Judith, that you can mention if, if folks do come up with some options? I've been trying to reach out, but I haven't had any luck yet locating those. So what was the process, Judith? Will we let, give that list to you or, or what? Yes, I think uh, the idea that uh, Ellen with creating an uh, ongoing list would be very helpful that then can be presented when there are potential um, investors popping up because once in a while they uh, they come reach out to me and just are like, so what's available? And so they can look out. I think to have that at a, a local and through the affordable housing committee, also with, with Hannah Davis, that would be very helpful. So I would know where to reach out to when that happens. Okay, great. And, and uh, I'm really excited to, to see this sort of bubbling up to the surface. Uh, so hopefully we will get some action plans going forward. One of the things that I would like to throw out is that once we get to the place that we start placing people in homes, uh, we need to start thinking about the wraparound services to keep them there. And the reason I mention that is the organization that I work for, we do have affordable housing. And there is no way that a for-profit institution could be a landlord to, to many of these folks because they take so much time um, and, and incredible. It, it, it takes more effort to manage one of these uh, tenants than it might be 10 of folks that were in a, a better situation. So that's something for us to think about is what kind of resources might be available not only for the tenants, but letting the landlords know what resources they can access to notify the tenants of that. Because right now we have two tenants that were really having a difficult time keeping them in, in, in our uh, rental units because they're so problematic. Yeah, so I'm I, to, you have to, you know, offer to the landlord that, you know, you'll, you'll be the coach for that tenant and if you want to get the landlord to. Councilman Porterfield. Thank you uh, so very much, and, and thank y'all for this uh, very uh, 
wonderful information that, that we're hearing. I do have a question. Um, many times my constituents reach out wondering uh, what they can do when they see unhoused individuals either um, standing, um, panhandling, or when we see encampments in our community, uh, there have been some people that have reached out and said they wanted to help um, connect the individuals with resources. So are there any you know, recommendations on anything that the community um, can do to help? And then I've also um, had property owners, when they have an encampment on their property, you know, not really sure about which direction to go in um, to try to connect those individuals with the resources. So um, can you guys speak to that at all about what the community can do? That's a, that's a great question. Mr. Alexander, are you raising your hand to answer that one? Unmute, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now, yes. All right, I was following up on Councilwoman Van Reese's question. Trevor wanted to share that Patriot Place was actually funded by one of our home projects. And we do have a similar home project that's similar to that um, project that should be underway um, next year for 22 single room occupancy units. Where is that located? That will be located at 1609 Buchanan. Gotcha. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, good. Thank you for that. Um, back to Councilmember Porterfield's question. Can anyone um, address the question of how, how can constituents help? What is the appropriate response? Yes, uh, this is Judy again. So we do have a booklet um, that actually Open Table Nashville publishes in our community called Work to Turn in Nashville. So one of the things, so when individuals are asking right now how to assist people, um, in summer I would recommend that uh, we all carry some extra water <laughs> with us, hand that out. Um, uh, see if there are um, some key resources actually in your district and in your area. And actually I could uh, make someone available to help uh, figure that out and have a flyer if you want that, that can be distributed in your district. Just with a few numbers or the word to turn in Nashville booklet is very um, comprehensive, but it may be a little too much or overwhelming. The other thing is a lot of people um, that are experiencing homelessness, word of mouth is, don't underestimate, most people know where to go. Um, they know rescue mission, they know room in the inn. Um, it's just uh, be helpful to see if there's something maybe in the area that they may not be aware of. Uh, in summer also, if you can have box spray or something with you, Mm -hmm. um, uh, just something that people can use immediately, uh, I, I would encourage that. Now, for property owners, uh, you can always send them my way with, and with the email address. Um, we, what, we, what we do right now, I have one person uh, that is available to do outreach in the entire uh, Davidson County. It's not enough. And all we do most of the time is follow up on some complaints and that come through in through the hub or from other departments to check on people. Uh, what we do is check on, um, let people know what the issues are, the concerns a property owner has. We talk to the property owners, see what needs to happen. Um, at present with COVID, we really, really encourage nobody to move encampments because one of the side effects is you move COVID with it if somebody has it. Um, and there are no easy, there, nobody, people can access um, shelter, but we can go out, check on them and let them know how to do that. Um, so uh, property owners, just have them email me um, what, what's happening. Even um, a lot of police precincts, they reach out to us first so we can check if people are linked and know about services. And so we can check back with property owners and complaints and actually um, let the people know what is going on, where what complaints are happening, so they are informed. Thanks, that's that's very helpful. I don't see any other questions right now, but some may pop up in another minute. Uh, Councilmember Sepulveda, let me say one thing, and then I will recognize you. Um, Judy and Ingrid, could y'all both um, would y'all be willing to supply us with your PowerPoint points to put on the affordable housing 
um, SharePoint, just so we can keep that information available. Yes, I'll, I'll just forward it to you. Is that? Yeah, that would be great. I appreciate that. That'd be great. Uh, Council Member Sepulveda. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a quick question. So you all are receiving uh, 10 million through the ESG grant program. And then you're saying the urgent needs are food, water, cooling stations, internet, uh, mental health, um, transportation, and then hotel vouchers. And so I wanted to know if the 10 million would be used to address some of that, or if you all will be asking for CARES Act money from uh, that that uh, Metro received, because um, being on that committee, we, we do have our uh, initial recommendations due August 3rd. So I, I just wanted to know if there was um, any ask that you guys would be making. For the immediate needs, uh, like food, water, all of that, uh, the process has been that we would request that through OEM. So I don't know, um, I actually need to see if there is a direct way or something specific, but that's how we've been going through that to get some um, care dollars through uh, OEM and they um, look at that on um, any of the ESG funds, if somebody from MDHA would wanna take that. Hello, this is Emil. Some of the um, those are eligible expenses under the first allocation of ESG that's out there that closes tonight. So nonprofit organizations are eligible to apply for some of those um, eligible items under this round of funding. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members? We're coming up on, ooh, I see lots of hands. We're coming up on an hour and a half, but we've got this for another half hour if we need it. Council member Porterfield, is that a new question? It is, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I apologize if I missed this already, but where can nonprofits go to apply for that uh, grant? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, they would have to have requested a copy of the RFA from our procurement department. Um, but if you would like a copy, I can send you send it over to you. But we sent it out through our contact list, through the COC membership um, contact list, and we also posted it via social media and some of the newspapers. Yes, I would like a copy, please. Thank you. And Mr. Alexander, maybe we could put that on the um, affordable housing website as well. Or, uh, I mean, if you can send it to me, I'll put it on that place as well. I'm guessing the more places we have it, the better. Is that right? Yes, but remember, it closes tonight at 12 p.m. At well, 12 I think we're talking about the eight and a half million one that's opening up. So that will be a separate RFA. So, but we can make sure that you guys get a copy of that RFA when it goes out. When it goes out, that would be. When do you, when do you think that will happen? Um, we hope to prioritize the priority areas this week, and we said within the next 30 days we'll get it out. Next week. Because the needs are out there right now. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Sabat with a new one or the same one? Okay, I heard someone. Mr. So Alexander, you got more? Yeah, one more thing to add. We don't actually have the funds yet. We will HUD should release it within the next couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, that's they're allocated to us, but they're not sort of sitting in an account anywhere. So I wanted to clarify that. Thanks for that clarification. Okay. Any other questions while we've got these amazing resources here? Um, I just want to thank everyone, uh, all the council members who got on this call. It's clear we all care a lot and want to know as much as we can. And now hopefully we can start doing some things now that we've been educated. And uh, thank, thank Judith and Ingrid and... Eva and uh, Neil Alexander and all the other folks who are working hard. I think we lost Hannah um, just to create options for people to get permanent housing. Um, and, you know, again, as, as legislators, we are always looking for ways that we can clear obstacles or create opportunities. So if, um, if any of the providers become aware of something that we can do that, that is helpful, we are 
absolutely eager eager to do that. So um, we're always ready to be educated. And um, at this moment, I don't know if we have anything for our next um, council meeting on the agenda, um, but we can continue to meet on uh, every Monday just so we can have a touch point, um, you know, to see if, if anyone has got legislation working that they would like um, like input on. So just very briefly before I, I officially adjourn us, um, it would be helpful to get kind of uh, input from other, at least affordable housing committee members. Is it is it useful to us for us to meet briefly, even if we don't have any items on the um, council agenda, just to touch base on what we might be able to be continuing to do? Can I have yeas or nays? All those in favor of meeting? Let me know. Yay. All right, Gloria, you and me. <laughs> okay, bless you. Yeah, I'm not on the committee, but I would love to check in with you as often as you can. Okay, that's that's great. That's great. Well, I will I will get us get us on the agenda then, and get, we'll be there and be available with that. Um, if there is no other business, Councilmember Parker, I see your um, mic going. Do you have anything else to, you'd like to say? I, I was just going to chime in and say that I think we should continue meeting. Uh, Great. You know, each each time that there's an opportunity to do so. Great, and I, I think now that hopefully that that some of this scheduling craziness is behind us, we can continue to schedule informational uh, stuff. So there's still plenty of other folks we can we can learn from. So I will set that up. Thanks for that input. Anybody else have any business? Councilmember Hurd, do you have anything else you want to throw out there? No, thank you very much. I appreciate us being able to have this meeting and I want to thank the members of Health Hospitals and Social Services for uh, being on the call and this will give us a framework of some things that we need to um, move forward with so I'm, I'm really grateful. Great thank you all right so send me those lists of places we want to get built and we'll start with that. All right we are adjourned thanks everyone for joining us. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.net.